Okay, welcome everybody to today's Scientists to Go. Uh, today we're joined by Dr. Juan Torres Perez, who is a research scientist at the Earth Science Division of NASA. He works to help us better understand our coral reefs through image and community science. Um, he also is part of the Oceanos program, which engages Hispanic and Latinx individuals in community science. Uh, so I'm really excited for his presentation today. Quick note before I turn it over, if at any time any of you come up with any questions, you can always put it in the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A section. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lou. And uh, <clears throat> thanks for for the invitation. And this is, uh, I really, really, really enjoy this, uh, doing this. Um, okay, let's see if I can, if I can share my screen here. All righty. And then how does it look? Does it look okay there? Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, <clears throat> well, again, thanks, thanks for inviting me and, uh, <clears throat> And I also like to 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 welcome you all to to this. Um, what I I'm what I will do is that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about myself and then some of the, some of the projects that I that I've been working on in the in the past uh, years or so. And uh, and as as you mentioned, my, I'll finish with the with my latest one, which is uh, Oceanos, which is a uh, NASA science activation uh, project. But uh, but yeah, let's let's go. Let's let's hit it. Um, okay, so yeah, a little bit about me, and then I'll talk about my my preferred uh, marine ecosystem uh, in the world, which are coral reefs, and, uh, and then some of the tool, no, some of the uh, NASA tools that I that we've been using in regards to coral reefs, and I, like I said, eventually I'll I'll finish with with Oceanos. <clears throat> All right, a little bit about me. I was uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean, and uh, and and that's where I also did all my my studies, my undergrad in biology at the University of Puerto Rico, and then eventually did a master's in in geological oceanography and a PhD in, in biological oceanography, and then I I was a professor at the university there for four years. And eventually had the opportunity to come to NASA Ames in California, the Bay Area, to do a postdoc here for two years. And I worked with the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute uh, for about four years, uh, about for about eight years. And eventually in 2021, I, I became a civil servant with uh with NASA's Earth Sciences Division. So one of the definitely one of the things that I'm more passionate about is uh <clears throat> actually uh, teaching others about the marine environment and and the importance of uh, of, of uh, all of these uh, different ecosystems and that's what you see what you see there on the on the left hand side is uh was a citizen science project I had some years ago uh, back in Puerto Rico on the on the on the far right is uh, me doing one of the things that I that I love the most which is uh, diving of course I've, I've been diving for 30 woof, 33 years already my goodness and uh and and then uh when i was in puerto rico when i was doing my masters and my phd uh believe it or not i was also uh an umpire uh, 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 uh we umpire anything from little league to to double a triple a uh baseball so <clears throat> oh, all the uh from, from little kids from to to grown-ups um and it was also a lot of fun but uh, but yeah, just uh, if, for those of you who don't know where Puerto Rico is at, we are Puerto Rico is in the Caribbean. There's that that this little star over there uh, on the on the on the map on the far right, um, just by the Dominican Republic, and it's uh, <clears throat> it's the, the the smallest of the of the bigger Antilles. And uh, and in Puerto Rico, I am from the west coast. Uh, that's from uh, this orange star is uh, there. It's called it's a town called Mayagüez. And I did my master's and PhD, particularly in to me what it is one of the most beautiful regions in the whole world. It's called La Palguera, a natural reserve in Puerto Rico on the southwest coast, which is this this uh, little rectangle here. And uh, and just to give you an idea, um, this was my my pretty much my backyard for for about 10 years so not bad at all right 
And you can see, you know, you can see the, the the transparency of the water here. You know, you can some on, on good days, you can see the bottom from the from the from the from the surface, and and the bottom could be at say 60, 70 feet of water, and you can see it. You can still see it from the surface. So, so, so it's a, a very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place <clears throat> in the in the tropics. And as you can see, see here, it's pretty much surrounded by coral reefs. That's that's where I when I when I got my passion about these uh, these uh, ecosystems. But like I said, I work. Uh, I'm personally I've been working at Ames since 2011. This is NASA Ames in the Bay Area, <coughs> in in California. Um, and NASA Ames is known for a uh, number of different things. One of them is that it has the biggest wind tunnel, which is this one over here on the on the on the on the left side, the biggest wind tunnel in the world. It's this thing is is huge. It's, it's about uh, I think it's about 80 feet by 20 feet or so. It's it's, it's amazing. Uh, you can pretty much fit a, a helicopter in there if if you like. It's it's used for to do a lot of uh, of studies on thermodynamics and uh, and other other things. Um, and within Ames, I have a, a very small office uh, slash cubicle uh, over here, uh, and that's where I usually sit. Although I most times I work from from home. All right, I mentioned uh, coral reefs, and uh, that I am passionate about coral reefs because these are to me one of the most biodiverse marine ecosystems in in the world. When you know when you think about coral reefs, um, they there's literally thousands of species of all sizes that depend on on these ecosystems from microscopic organisms to to large mammals like uh, dolphins and, and whales uh, sometimes uh, <clears throat> also reptiles like sea turtles and uh, even us humans uh, many many of these ecosystems they provide sustenance for literally millions of people uh, around the world um, well, unfortunately, they are threatened by human activities and also by climate change uh, uh, situations or, or, or different factors, and um, and they are they, we have to protect them because they are natural barriers against uh, wave action in particular. Places in, in in islands where there are coral reefs, yeah. If a hurricane comes by, they they help uh, buffering all that wave action. Uh, and as it gets to the shore, and eventually they serve as a as a as a as a protective barrier there uh, against uh, wave action. Like I said, they they provide sustenance for millions of people, even though they cover only about one percent of the whole ocean floor. <clears throat> and uh, and particularly, there's a lot of people that um, that live around the coastlines that are, that are they either are fishers or they have recreational. They do recreational activities, or obviously you know, there's a lot of tourism also uh, in in the tropics. You know, we all like to go to to the Caribbean, to Hawaii, to to the Pacific, many many other many of those islands. Um, but unfortunately, this this ecosystem has been threatened for for a while, and uh, and we we have lost a lot of them. Uh, unfortunately, here's some of the some of the cool organisms that you can see. Uh, in a coral reef, uh, of course, corals, right? Uh, different types of corals, like branching corals, uh, uh, brain corals, and and others. Like I said, sea turtles. Um, here's a here's a moray eel uh, as well on the uh, on the on the top right. And there's a <clears throat> uh, this is the the long spine black sea urchin. That uh, the name as the, as the name implies, right? Uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, and also, what you see on the here on the on the right in the middle photo, uh, I don't know if you can guess what that is, but that is a sea cucumber uh, from from Hawaii. And you, what you see there is the mouth of it, <clears throat> as it opens the mouth to capture, you know, small or uh, organisms, uh, uh, little, yeah, very little organisms. Uh, so yeah, when you when you, you, uh, when you think about aliens, this is, uh, kind of looks like an alien, right? But uh, but it, it is an actual uh, sea cucumber from 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 Hawaii. Here's uh, one of the interesting visitors that you can see. Oh, play it again.
Uh, yes, of course. The, the 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 voice you hear there there is, is myself. Uh, uh, as I was uh, I was looking at this very beautiful green mori eel in the in the in, in the shellfish in Puerto Rico, and uh, yeah, that's why I choose that as a as my um, as my sidekick. You know, they're, they're, they can be scary. Of course, they have big mouth with big feet, but they're usually they just they just they're just swimming around. They're not. They're typically they're not dangerous uh, to to humans, unless you bother them too much then then they will bite because they they will obviously be defending themselves okay so i mentioned reefs and um and the i guess the unique also characteristic of reefs is that they are built by corals corals are animals so when you look when you go to do some snorkeling in a coral reef or so you'll see things that are apparently rocks beautiful rocks with, with colors those are corals and those are live animals and and the colors of those colors are are given by a relationship that they have with a microscopic organism, which is called a sosanteli. And that organism lives inside the tissues of, of, of corals. And, and just to give you an idea of how many, these are microscopic, so unicellular, one cell is, is each of them. And to give you an idea of how many can be inside a coral, in the coral tissue, for every square centimeter, which is pretty small of tissue, you can find anywhere from 500,000 to 5 million cells of these sosanteli. And, and they are photosynthetic, so they use the light as similar to plants, uh, but, but they're, they're not plants, but, they, but they're, they're, they're more related to algae. Um, similar to plants, they use the, the sunlight to photosynthesize and, and produce their uh, uh, the 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 products that they eventually consume, and part of the relationship is that they pass a lot of those products, about eighty to ninety percent, to the coral, and then the coral in return gives them a space of where to live inside their tissue. So there's this uh, very unique and uh, and very practical symbiotic relationship between an animal and uh, and, uh, and this microscopic algae. And if it wasn't for this relationship, we wouldn't have uh, any coral reefs at all uh, in the world. So it's, it's, it's quite unique. Um, but unfortunately, this relationship has been threatened by, by, by many factors. One of them is you may have heard in the news uh, uh, sometimes about what is, what is known as coral bleaching. What happens with coral bleaching is that, as you see in some of the photos there from the, the, the latest one was the 2014 to 2017 global coral bleaching event. And actually, right now, there might be another one happening. Uh, and that's been happening in the last uh, couple of years. And, uh, and what happens there is that the either the coral releases the sosanteli from, the, from, their, from their tissues or the sosanteli, they lose their pigments. And then eventually what you see is where something as uh, what you're seeing here in the in the bottom uh, photo, where the coral is, is alive, but it loses it, it loses the, their pigments or the sosanteli or both. And, and once it gets to this uh, situation, it becomes really fragile uh, because uh, for once it doesn't have, you know, about 90% of its food. So, <clears throat> Uh, it can uh, almost can't survive uh, there, and lots of time. Eventually, they end up dying, and and then eventually they um, they get covered by algae or some other very competitive organisms. And uh, once they go beyond that point, there's there's no way back. So in the in the in the 2014 2017 about 93 percent of the Great Barrier Reef uh, was hit by coral bleaching. The Great Barrier Reef is the biggest uh, 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 reef system in in the world in Australia. This is what happens. What I mentioned before. This this is actually this was a photo on the on the sequence of photos in the on the on the left top left. It's from from American Samoa. And um, you see in 2014, a healthy coral reef there, then the, because of bleaching, they were dying in, in February of 2015. And you can see this is, we're talking about three months of difference only. And, and then in, in August, everything was dead uh, uh, already. So it's, uh, it, was, it was very, very uh, devastating, this, this bleaching event. 
and uh, and it was mostly because of this this was the this was the the temperatures in the in the waters yeah and um, you know the 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 graphic uh, speaks for itself you can see the 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 redder it is the the hotter the 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 waters are right and uh, and this was an average for the for for all those uh three almost four years uh in the in the world and it's 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 uh, becoming more um, the sea surface temperatures are becoming higher and higher uh on each day i just downloaded this from last week actually from the copernicus site and I, what I what you see here, and I'll explain the the graph really quick to you. The dotted line here is the average from the last three decades. This is the, the average sea surface temperature from the last three year, three decades. The the orange one is last year. The average for for each month for last year. The red one is the first two and a half years of the uh, of twenty twenty four. Uh, you you can definitely it doesn't matter what age you have you can see that the the, the the there's a there's a tendency here you know of, of increasing and increasing temperatures in the in in, in on the on a global basis right so so we don't know where where, where this will will get us unfortunately um but we do have techniques that uh, that can help us study these ecosystems and what's happening to these ecosystems. The one that I that I uh, use the most is called spectroscopy, and it's, it's you see myself here in these two, two two bottom photos, and this is a housing, an underwater housing, an enclosure, and inside there there's an there's an instrument that it's think of it as a camera, as a very fancy camera, I would say. Um, but instead of taking photos, uh, actually the new version also takes a photo of whatever uh, you're getting the info from. Uh, but instead of taking photos, what it does is that it gives you data that you can put into a graph, similar to the ones that we have here on the right. And what it's showing is that you can use that information to, to even to, to separate the different species of, of corals. And uh, or separate the corals from other other organisms that are in in the in the coral reef, and then it provides for a mean that you you don't you don't need to touch the coral. You can just take a a photo in quotes, you know, uh, uh, of this, and it will tell you. You can use that to to assess the health of the of that organism, and if and if a if a bleaching event uh, happens, then or or a disease outbreak, you can follow. The development of that uh, event, kind of like what I'm showing here, where where the 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 bottom lines are the healthy corals, kind of like the 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 photo that, the photo that you see here on the on the on the uh, the bottom right. The middle photo is a coral that is is is, is bleaching. It started to bleach there, and the and the up the upper photo is a coral that is already bleached, and uh, and. It looks very different when you when you look at the graph. Um, you know, it looks very very different from from the from the healthy ones. So you can use this information to eventually try to uh, <clears throat> to assess the condition of coral reefs, and and then transfer that to let's say uh, satellite images and and uh, and others. That is a, a technique that I've been using for for a while. The other tool that I wanted to to show you guys is this is something that uh that uh the the director of the lab for advanced sensing uh Shirayev and and, the, and I was part of this project um came up with this is actually flying this is a drone flying in, in, in Puerto Rico in that same area that I that I showed you before and um and through a NASA citizen science uh grant we uh, develop a tool where you can you and by, by you I mean you guys you uh, uh, students you can help us characterize coral reefs either in in this is a, a, a satellite image either using a satellite image with very little information or on on or on a three dimensional structure here uh, as well. Where uh, and this is the the three the three D ones in particular I uh, I like very much because you can you can even rotate them with your fingers and uh, and then paint them and then submit that and that help us 
uh, feed into a, a machine learning al uh, 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 algorithm to uh, the, so that eventually it can it, uh, it can do it by itself. Um, so there's already and here's a here's a short video of, of Nimonet. It's the app. It's the the app that I that I was mentioning. And uh, here it is. You you can download it uh, in your app or or an, I mean in your you know in your iPad or your iPhone. And there's already the the Android version as well uh, in the Google Store. And and it's obviously it's free. Oh, uh, and uh, and then what you pretty much what you do is that you go through a tutorial, and it will teach you how to do it. And eventually, you get you start getting images. The first one that you the first ones you get are are very relatively simple, just coral versus you know bare ground. And then as you as you, as you start submitting and submitting uh, these characterizations, eventually you will uh, get more and more images that are more and more advanced until you become a, you know, quite an expert in, in, in doing this. The importance, uh, again, is that everything that you submit is actually very valuable to us, uh, even if it's just one characterization that is, that is valuable. Um, obviously, the, you know, it's, it's quite a... a, a I think it's... A, it's a, <clears throat> It's, it's something that you will really like. Um, and once you start doing it, you, you might not stop. Uh, 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 that's, that's the idea. And, uh, and you can choose images from, from the Pacific, from the, we have, there's, there's data from Guam, from American Samoa, from Hawaii. Um, there's also data from Puerto Rico as well. And, uh, and we've been um, putting more and more images into the, into the app uh, each day. Uh, to to make it more and more robust and give it more give more and more options to the uh, to the to the people. Already, there's more there's more than seventy thousand people uh, using the the Nemonet app uh, worldwide on a worldwide basis. And uh, so yeah, as a school uh, <clears throat> a tool to teach uh, uh, students to to do this uh, characterizations, it's, it's ideal. Uh, also, and it's a phone tool to uh, to use. You pay, you're basically painting uh, there. And, uh, and as you mentioned, my my latest project is is called Oceanos. It's a science activation project, and the the idea of it is to increase the participation of Hispanic and Latinos in STEM, uh, particularly in oceanography. We do this in Puerto Rico as well. Uh, with summer internships for uh, low income high school and first generation students in Puerto Rico. Uh, 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 undergrad students in Puerto Rico, and they are trained for a whole month of for the for the whole month of June in ocean color analysis uh, with using NASA data, so satellite images. They build their own instruments from scratch, uh, water quality instruments, and they test them against state of the art bio optical instruments. And uh, obviously, being in Puerto Rico, they lo they learn about the biology and the ecology of, of of tropical coral reefs and other ecosystems like seagrasses, and uh, and they also uh, learn about the use of Nimonet, the app, the application that I just showed you, uh, which by the way, through Oceanos, Nimonet will become the first bilingual global coral reef characterization app out there, and uh, and and they also learn on how to build corals with 3D printing and to and, and we, we are using them in, in some parts of the island also to increase the the what's called the reef rugosity uh oh, the, the the topography of the reef so more and more species eventually come to the reef and they use those as as refugees uh, as refu uh, for for just to <clears throat> for their for their populations so yes we had our first pilot last year with 20 students and this year we have 60 uh, students, uh, 20 in person, I mean, 30 in person and 30 remote. And, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I, I bet. <clears throat> and we got some last year, we got some pretty, very, very, very nice reviews from the, from the participants. They were, they, they were really engaged at the end. They, they, they do a story map presentation and they present it to the general public. And uh, and some of them might even we might even uh, <clears throat> uh, um, take them with with us to to uh, international conferences 
uh, like Sagnas and others, uh, just so they can present their, their their findings. So yeah, that is in a in a nutshell. That's uh, that's one of the things and uh, some of the things that I do here uh, at Ames. Uh, also, uh, like I said, uh, the, the you know the ocean is a, is is my passion, uh, especially uh, the tropical areas. And uh, but uh, again, I'd like to thank you all, and I I'll, I'll take any any questions uh, that you guys might have. Thanks, Drew. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I had no idea about the sy symbiotic relationship, so that was really cool to talk <laughs> about. Um, so great. Yes, if anybody has any questions, you can pop them in the chat. We have about fifteen minutes for any Q and A. Um, I'll start with a question of my own, which is I'm curious if you could talk a little more about how that camera works. How is it able to, or not the, the camera, how is it able <laughs> to figure out which species is which for the coral? Well, it's it, it's it's for us to figure out well, which species is. We right. um the what it what what happens is that uh, um uh, uh <clears throat> I'm not I'm calling it a camera, you know, to, to keep it simple, but it's uh, it's called a spectro a spectro uh, radiometer. And what it does is that, uh, you know, within the within the electromagnetic spectrum, there's the UV radiation, there's the visible radiation, which is the we call it visible because it's, it's what we can see, and then there's a uh, 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 infrared and and others, right? So it it works within the a little bit of the UV towards the infrared, so it covers the the visible radiation, and this is where the where the coral where the where the pigments the chlorophylls and and carotenoids and other pigments this is where they absorb uh light right to 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 produce photosynthesis and uh and and it just so happens that uh that depending on on the on the on the type of pigments that the organisms have and the concentration of pigments is the signal that you will get and in those in those uh uh graphs and uh, um, just by using that, that signal and the and the information on where are the different peaks in each of the graph, then you can you can use that as a, kind of as, as an ID method to uh, to uh, to identify the the different coral species. This is in 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 the in, in diapers. So, you know, so far we we only tested it with with seven different species in Puerto Rico, and, and we noticed that we. Depending on the species, we had uh, anywhere from about eighty to ninety-eight percent and and success uh, there. So there's there's promising there's promising the uh, future there for for the technique. There's a lot of grounds to, still to be covered. How cool! That's amazing that someone figured that out. I love that. All right, we have a lot of questions rolling in. Um, the first one from Millbridge is: How long have you been interested in bio optical oceanography? Oh yeah, that's a good question. You know what? It's interesting. I well, I always say that ever since I put my the, my first mask on, I, I I knew that I wanted to be a marine biologist, right? And this I was probably I don't know the, very around the age of my of my kid, eight or nine years old, uh, in a in a in a beach in Puerto Rico the first time I tried it, and I saw little little fishes here and there, and uh, but I was I was in awe. Um, but but uh but but actually what I wanted to do when I when I when I when I when I thought of being a marine biologist I wanted to work with sharks, uh but uh but uh <clears throat> but I, it didn't happen and I had the opportunity I met a, a professor at the university and he was doing he was working with corals and that's how he eventually ended up working with coral reefs, and uh, and then. I through my PhD advisor, who's still my my very good colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Roy Armstrong from the University of Puerto Rico. Um, he's the one who kind of introduced me to bioptical oceanography, and then I started learn, started learning about water quality, uh, about interpreting the the color of the water, and then how that relates to to the penetration of light into the water column and eventually to how the, how the, the corals use the, uh, the light to, you know, to, to produce a, the photosynthesis, the sosantelli inside the corals. And, uh, and yeah, it's a long story short. Yeah. I've been, I've been working in, in bioptical oceanography for, for a couple of decades already. That's amazing. And how cool you got to grow up. Yeah. Going underwater like that. All right. We have lots of questions. Alfred elementary is curious what you think the coolest species of coral that you've ever found or know about is. <laughs> uh, but to, uh, yeah, I'm biased. To me, all of them are cool. But uh, <laughs> but probably the one of one of the coolest one is the one that you have there on the 
in the in the screen right now. It's it's called the elk horn coral from from the Caribbean, Acropora palmata, and I it it grows uh, in shallow water, typically in waters less than um, let's say 30, 30 feet of water, and uh, but it grows relatively fast, and uh, um, and by fast I mean corals, uh, the rounded corals, the brain corals, on an average day would go maybe, uh, I don't know, a centimeter a year. Okay. Uh, versus these ones can probably grow maybe a centimeter a month or or, or every every couple of months. So they, their, their growth rate is, is much faster. And th that allows them to cover more ground, you know, in a, in a, in a, <clears throat> in a short amount of time. Um, but also because of, as, as you can see in the photo, because of their structure, they provide uh, habitat for a lot of other species. You see, you know, some different types of angel fishes are uh, there, say, sergeant fishes and others uh, among many, not only fishes, but also a lot of uh, invertebrates, lobsters and and, um, and shrimps and crabs and, and um, octopus and many, many others. How cool. I didn't know that they grew, I guess, so slowly and cool that that one can grow fast, um, yeah. which kind of brings us to a different question we got, which is, how long does a coral live in a normal lifespan as opposed to this compromised bleaching lifespan? Very good question. Very good question. Um, actually, when when I when I was doing my masters, one of the we use a technique uh, called scleroclonology, and what you do is that you literally drill a hole through a colony, um, and then you you make slabs out of it, and then you take an X-ray, kind of like the X-rays that you know we usually do. Uh, in a in an urgent care or whatever, and and in those egg rays you will see the the growth bands of the corals. Similar to you may have heard that trees have growth bands, right? And people use those called dendrochronology, and people use those to measure the age of the trees. So corals are they they, they do a similar thing. They they have growth bands in their skeleton, and you can use those growth bands to 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 measure the age of the of the corals and um and there's been studies for instance in, in puerto rico where people have measured coral colonies coral colonies that are 20 feet height i'm talking huge colonies and uh and they are probably 800 years old you know it's it's amazing yeah uh, as as the as the as the as the person who who asked the question you know uh, <clears throat> mentioned Yes, and uh, and and these colonies, even though they are so old, they can in, in during a bleaching event they can die in in a matter of, matter of months. So, oh so you're gosh. talking about a colony that is literally hundreds of years old, that can eventually die in a month. Oh, that's so devastating! I I didn't realize they could get that old. Oh my gosh. Um. All right. Maybe on a, a slightly lighter note of how many, have you seen any strange animals or mutations or what's the coolest animal you've seen? We got a couple of questions about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. One of, oh gosh, I don't have a photo here, but one of the, if you can Google it, one of the, one of the coolest animals that I, that I, and I, 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 I love underwater photography and, uh, and it is one of the, one of the, the, my favorite ones in terms of, of photographing them. Fortunately, I didn't put a, a photo here in the presentation, but it's called the Christmas tree worm, and it's it's a it's a worm about I would say, you know, it makes a hole in a coral and then you know builds a structure there, and eventually, what what you see is it's kind of like a Christmas tree, but about I would say maybe about an inch or so tall. You know, it's small, and. Uh, and and uh, and it's you know it's it's they're beautiful they have beautiful colors, and uh, I'm, I'm, the way that it feeds is that let's say that a that a, a particle of, of of something gets into their into their you know those uh, branches of also, eventually they start moving the the uh, the particle all around all around the what would be the Christmas tree right until it eventually gets to the to the mouth. And then they eat that 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 particle. You know, the Christmas tree worms and are 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 just beautiful, beautiful animals. And that's probably one of the one of the coolest ones. There's, I mean, that, that, that's the beauty of 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 this. I'm, and like I said, I've been diving for 33 years, more than 2,000 dives. Most most of them have been in, in in coral reefs. And I always say that I've never had a two dives that are the same. You know, there's always something new, uh, something different that you see there.
That's amazing. I, I just looked it up. And if you have not yet Googled what a Christmas tree worm looks like, you definitely should. Um, super interesting looking. We got a question of, is the Christmas tree worm a type of coral or it's something that feeds on coral? No, it's a, it's a worm. It's literally a worm. It's actually a worm. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> it's it's a worm, and uh, and it doesn't really feed in, in uh, on the coral. It makes a you know it bores a hole there uh, and then lives there, uh, but it doesn't feed on the coral. It feeds it. It's a filter feeder organism, so it, it filters the water and eventually you know traps um, uh, small particles, and that, that's what uh, that's how, uh, what it eats. Cool, that's great. That's awesome looking. Uh, learning about new species, I love it. All right, we got a few different types of questions on water temperatures. Um, some folks are curious what the worst water temperature is. So maybe like, what's do you know what the biggest jump in water temperatures are? I do know that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than a lot of the world's oceans. Um, but I, yeah, maybe you have some more intel on that. No, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said in the, what, like I showed in the graph, you know, 2023 broke the record um, pretty much every month. Uh, on a on a global basis, and uh, it looks like 2024 will will do the same. Um, last year we had uh, uh, in the, during the during the during during the summer in particular in the Caribbean. The Caribbean was 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 hit you know dramatically last year because of coral bleaching and the uh, sea surface temperatures. But there were uh, there were days there when the the water temperature would get to about thirty between thirty two and thirty three degrees Celsius. That's uh, uh, I don't know in Fahrenheit that could be eighty five or or, or or something. That's almost boiling water for 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 these organisms, you know. And uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it it, it the, the, it's, it's looking that it's it's, it's gonna follow the same that same pattern. Uh, uh, during this year, um, unfortunately. So we, I guess we got a question similar to that about, uh, do you think that all the coral will eventually die off or maybe what's being done to prevent that from happening? There's, there's a lot of studies that are, that are, that are, that are, that are people are doing all sorts of different, different uh, experiments. Um, some people, for instance, uh, there's uh, some some uh, some researchers at, at Stanford actually. They work. They have their they they they're study sites in American Samoa, and they have found that some of these uh, organisms are more resistant to to to, to high sea surface temperatures than, than others, or even more resistant to to being exposed uh, out of the water uh, for you know like uh, uh, maybe uh, hours or so. And uh, and they're they're trying to see if some of those can eventually be used to kind of repopulate some of the other some of, some some other areas uh, as well. There's people that are that are moving. For instance, I have some some colleagues and friends in Puerto Rico from one of the local NGOs there, and they are doing uh, they're transplanting corals from from deep waters to shallow waters and from shallow waters to deep waters and see how they behave um, to eventually. Uh, see if that could be an option. You know, uh, they all they also work a lot on um, building coral farms. So they take corals, kind of like the like this, the like the elk horn or sac horn corals, and uh, and these reproduce uh, asexually by fragmentation. So you break the, if they break and they and they find a place to to settle, they eventually a new a new colony will grow. And uh, and that's what they do with with coral farms. They take little bit of pieces uh, there and they grow them. In, in mass production, and then eventually they use those to to kind of repopulate repopulate uh, some of the areas. So there's there's a lot of experiments that are being done uh, in regards to to coral reefs and, and what would be the the potential future of them uh, if you know if 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 the if the temperatures uh, keep rising. Wow. Okay. I'm glad glad to hear the work is being done on it. Obviously, uh, that's really wonderful. We're gonna end with one final question for you today. Uh, which is what is your favorite part of your job? Oh, um, oh <laughs> besides besides being in the water, uh, whenever I can, because it's uh, you know, like I said, I, I just uh, <clears throat> I'm a water person, definitely. Um, 
but uh but but uh, one of my honestly one of my favorite parts uh of, of my job is is doing this this kind of thing you know it's it's spreading the word it's it's it's, it's uh, uh uh teaching others or, or uh what the about about the kind of work that i do or just showing them how what the kind of work that i do and uh um, just to show them that it's it, it is important uh, to do this type of of of, uh, of work uh, especially, especially to if we if we're trying to protect one of the again one of the most important in terms of biodiversity one of the most important uh, you know ecosystems out there and uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah I whenever I I have the chance to do this and again thanks Drew for 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 the invitation it, uh, it's it's one of the things that I'm passionate about. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing with us and telling us how to get involved. Uh, thank you all for your amazing questions. There are so many I want to ask but didn't have time for. Uh, so thanks for staying engaged. Before I let you go, just a quick plug for our next Scientist to Go program. We're going to be doing a full month this time uh, to leave some room for the eclipse and all the really cool things happening there. Uh, so our next program will be on April 23rd at 10 a.m. And we're going to be joined by Alyssa Marini, who's going to tell us about some of her work with uh mosquitoes and other cool insects, which will be interesting. Uh, so thank you all so much. If you want to just wave goodbye, uh, you can turn on your videos and do that now. But uh, thank you all so much.